Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike and Davina, and thank you so much for listening to this today. Really appreciate it. In today's episode, I'm interviewing Chris Crummett, who, if you're not familiar with him, he is a fantastic mixing and mastering engineer based out of Portland. He's worked with bands like Dance Gavin Dance, Issues, Sleeping with Sirens, and so many more. And he does a lot of really great work. So you're definitely going to want to check out his productions if you're not familiar with any of the work he's done so far. But inside of this interview, we get into some really cool details. He shares a lot about his automation checklist that he's got. And um, I'm not sure if it's a mental checklist or not that he's got, but he goes into some really good detail about the importance of using automation in your mixes and what kind of things you can do to add a lot of excitement with your mixes just by using automation alone. So you're definitely going to want to keep listening to hear that section. He also talks about the making of the STL Tones Tone Hub plugin and some of the presets that he made for that. So I think you're going to find that section really interesting as well. And it gives you some really cool insight into what goes into making an amazing amp sim. So that's enough of my rambling. Let's just jump right into the episode. Chris Carmen, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, man. Happy to be here. For people who might not necessarily know your background, can you give us a little bit of that story on who you are, what you do, and how you got into the world of music? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the long or the short of it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've been into music my whole life. Um, I was basically babysat by MTV in the 80s. Um, you know, it's it's always been a part of me, and I don't really remember a time uh, that m music wasn't super important to me. Um, you know, I started playing instruments as a, as a kid piano in like second grade and then picking up guitar in like fifth, sixth grade. And at the same time, you know, I was always recording stuff with my little tape recorder. I think that's kind of the classic story is you have that kid's tape recorder and you just kind of get obsessed with recording stuff and hearing it back. And, um, you know, once I started playing guitar, I was like, Oh yeah, if I play the guitar and record it, I can like play a different part or I can play the drums and play back to my recording. And then if I had another tape recorder, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you start to get that mentality. And then that turned into multi-tracking. Uh, you know, I was kind of ahead of the curve on that. So I was making my, my own band's demos, recording their demos and started recording demos for other people. Um, you know, and, and by the time I was like 15 or 16, I was recording a lot of stuff for people. Um, and that's kind of how I got my start and how I got my in. It's kind of always been in my blood. Um, it's not something I, I consciously chose to do. Life just kind of took me in that direction. Yeah, for sure. I think it's really funny hearing you say, tell the story about the, uh, the cassette recorders and all that kind of stuff. Cause I think there's a lot of people that fall into that boat, but then it's interesting to think of like this new generation of musicians who, especially right now with all, all the COVID stuff, like they're just learning to record because they're, they're at home and like their first foray into it is all completely digital and, and, you know, yeah. great software and great interfaces, great preamps, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's very different, but it's amazing. The tools that we have right now. I mean, I think like I, some people scoff at it, but I think about like, if I had that power when I was 12, <laughs> like I'd be, I'd probably be a lot further along now. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know. There's something to be said by like, uh, the trial and error of things out the world outside of plugins and whatnot. But, uh, but it's pretty cool. I'm, 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 I'm all for it. And so how did you learn to do all this stuff? Like, was it, was it just all trial and error? Or did you ever go to school for it or do an internship or any of that? I did some like non-official internships, but that was quite a long time after I uh, was already recording stuff. Um, so no, I just kind of like, honestly, I read a lot of like, my dad was really into um, tape op magazine and like mix magazine um, I think I have like tape op issue number three or four and like every single issue after that. Um, and they're from Portland too, where, where I'm from as well. So, um, I think we might have had that before a lot of people. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was just reading those magazines and kind of just trying to do what they were talking about and probably doing a lot of stuff wrong. Um, but, uh, yeah, never, never went to school. The internet really wasn't great when I started. Like there, it was basically just AOL. 
You know, there wasn't <laughs> a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of, um, information on the internet, no YouTube. It's incredible what, what, what we have now. So you said your dad was really into tape op. Was he into recording as well? Or was he a musician? He's a musician. Um, and just was very supportive of my love of recording. Um, and, I mean, he was in, he was into the idea of stuff. I, I don't think he, rec- he, he did record a couple things, I guess, but, um, it was more, I think he was just really into supporting me, um, doing that stuff. It's awesome. That's great to hear. Cause a lot of people don't have that situation. Right. So, you know, it, yeah. it is good to hear that supportive family background. Yeah. Both my parents were always super supportive of, uh, anything I did with music. You had mentioned earlier that you play a lot of instruments from like piano, guitar, drums, all that stuff. How do you feel that your ability to play those different instruments has influenced the work that you, that you do now? Oh, it's, it's super helpful. You know, w- when you produce music, I can't eat, Sometimes I try to think about what it would be like and, and people do a great job. I mean, there's guys like Rick Rubin out there that just know what they like and don't like, and it makes a great record. But, uh, you know, he has a good team and stuff too. But, but knowing, looking at a guitar when someone's playing guitar and knowing exactly what's going on and how to fix any problem, because I know how to play the guitar and I learned how to fix all those issues, you know, with the way you're playing things, holding chords, where the chords are being played. Uh, same with drums. I'm actually, I barely mentioned it, but I, I'm, I'm mainly a drummer. Um, so I have a really good understanding of drums, why they're sounding good, why they're not, uh, you know, where the stick needs to be hit. I had, uh, you know, I didn't have lessons in recording, but I had private lessons for drums and guitar and piano, um, drums. I had private lessons for like 12 years or something. So I learned a lot about music and about, um, the things that I'm recording. Like, even though I didn't learn about recording, I know a lot about the things that I am recording, um, so, so I definitely did have a somewhat of a formal education in that regard, but, but that's huge. That's super important to me. Um, you know, and, and playing piano helps me visualize scales. So when I'm working on, uh, vocal harmonies with people or, or really anything, how all the instruments work together, like having the ability to visualize, um, the scale the band is playing in, uh, and, and how all the notes work together, just having played piano and learned how to read music, um, playing piano, uh, I think is really important too. That's interesting that you said you're primarily a drummer. Um, and, and I think that that makes sense because one of the things that I really admire about your recordings is that, or, or even about your mixes and everything is that you have an amazing drum tone. And I can usually tell when I'm listening to a recording, like what instrument the person plays and considers their primary instrument, right? Like, I feel like that always kind of comes out a little bit, right? <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely, man. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty for sure. Drums are very important to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find as a drummer that you fixate on drums more than anything else? Uh, no, I try not to, but I, d- I don't fix, I, I definitely don't fixate on drums too much, especially now. Uh, it, it comes pretty natural, but I do build my mix around the drums for sure. I'm very guilty of that. I know a lot of people talk about like top down and all that stuff. And I'm, nah, I'm, I'm starting with the drums, <laughs> I'm building around it. That's just how my brain works. Yeah. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense too, just from a, a gain staging perspective as well. And, you know, yeah. getting all the transients and all that. Exactly. That That's what makes sense to me. That and like the ry- getting the rhythm section locked in is like really, really important for a mix to stand up. And then everything else you can kind of build around it. Like if I build a really good sound with the rhythm section, I feel like you could literally put the rest of the mix on a fader even if it's not mixed that well and just kind of turn it up and down into the master bus compressor and I could have a rad mix. But if I went the other way around, I, and I did, you know, I don't know, I don't think it would turn out that great if I was trying to do the drums last, just, just with how my, well, even from a, a low end perspective as well, right? Like getting that rhythm section down, that's, yeah, that covers exactly. so much ground, right? Yep. It's the stability, I think in the mix. One of the really interesting things that I, I find in, in your mixes is that you have this great ability of getting your toms to sound really punchy, really clear and full, but they don't sound bloated or boomy. And I was wondering if you could maybe share some insight on like, if you have any tips for how to get toms to cut through a mix and how to control that low end so that it's not overpowering and, and making everything else sound muddy. Yes. Um, toms, toms are important. <laughs> uh, and it's something that I battled with for a long time. And I think part of the key, I mean, there's a couple things that go into it. Uh, Obviously toms that are tuned well, um, and or samples that fit the pitch of the song really well. I I hear people using samples a lot of times that are just like way too low. Um, 
and you don't have to have like high pitched toms, but, um, you know, really be conscious of the, of the key, the songs in and how the toms sound with the guitars. Uh, cause a lot of times that like, like something you can do is listen to the toms and the guitars at the same time and turn up, put an EQ on the toms and turn up like 200 Hertz on both of them, like 150 to 200 way up and hear how it's resonating and see if that note matches the guitar part in the song, if that makes sense. Yeah. Cause that's like, that's the, that dissonance is one of the biggest things, uh, like ha- if, if you have dissonance there, that's one of the hardest things to make Tom's cut. Cause it, cause, cause your brain is just perceiving it really strange. Um, you know, if it doesn't match the guitars. So f- getting that sorted out first is really important. And then EQ wise, um, I, I'm not, I don't do anything crazy for, I try not to compress toms too hard. That's another thing. Um, I also manually gate all my tom tracks, uh, where I, you know, I'll go through the clip and I'll basically in Pro Tools, you can tab to transient, you know, um, and I'll just tab and Apple E and then I'll mute everything around the tom. Uh, and then I'll cut the tom track off again the next time the next drum hits, basically. So I'm not actually getting a lot of sustain out of the toms. Uh, I am out of the overheads, but not out of the tom track itself. That also helps. Um, and then EQ wise, I'm just boosting a lot of like, I'm probably boosting four to six dB of 10k, uh, 6k or 5k and like the 150 hertz area. A lot of times I'll use like a API type plugin or, um, you know, the real thing if I have it in front of me. Um, but, uh, that's great. And the last thing I'll say about Tom's is fab filter. Saturn is an amazing plugin. Uh, if you, your Tom's are sounding cool, but they're not like tight and punchy enough mess around with fab filter Saturn. And my, my trick with fab filter Saturn is make them sound absolutely absurd, like <laughs> way too over the top, way too clicky and way too crazy. But like, you know, the ultimate like metal video game sounding like nutso toms and then turn the <laughs> mix knob down to like 10. And that's what I do on all, a lot of my toms. Interesting. I have, I, yeah. Saturn is like going nuts, but the mix is only on like 10 to, to 20, never over 20. I think eight, like 15 to 18 is actually my magic range. But, uh, but that plugin can help a lot, but it can absolutely make things sound like crap too but um or just you know totally ridiculous but but that's what i do and then make them super clicky and crazy and then uh just turn the mix way down and you can get that extra snap and tightness but i think it makes sense with with the fact that you're manually gating you can get away with that because yep. you know you're only yep. getting those tom hits and that's it yep exactly and i'll and i'll i'll back them up with samples too if i need to um you know I, uh, another another thing that is really important with toms and drums in general to me is I find that I used to do this and I see a lot of people like wasting a lot of time trying to make the whole song sound right. Like as is like you're trying to make the toms on the whole song sound perfect by just adjusting some settings in your plugins, uh, you know, or your signal chain. But the really important thing, don't, don't spend too much time on that. Just get a decent sound on one part and then just run through really fast and just turn the toms up and down with automation, like where they need to hit. And I'm, I'm that way with the kick and snare too. Like um, you could spend all freaking day, like trying to get things to sound awesome from start to finish, but then they're never going to sound perfect. You know what I mean? Like you're never going to have the right amount of compression or the right levels. So just like, I just try to do something fast and then I go through and just turn things up. that need to come up things down. Uh, if I'm using plugins, I'll just automate the compression, you know, cause like no one hits every Tom hit perfectly or every snare hit the exact same volume. So, um, relying on automation, even though it seems, uh, like a laboring task, um, can actually be a lot faster and it will help all your little like extra floor Tom hits that, you know, if guys doing a super fast fill, the floor Tom is probably not super strong. Um, and just bump that up or throw a couple samples in there. Um, and move on. It's interesting that you brought up automation because one of the questions I wanted to ask you about was that I feel like one of your recent records that I really love the sound of is the Issues Beautiful Oblivion record. To me, like those mixes, they're they're super exciting. Like they have 
they have a lot of energy to them. And I feel like every time a new layer is introduced, like it just has a lot of impact when it first comes in and like it just catches your attention. And like to me, that I find that very exciting to listen to. And like I'm just captivated by the mix as like and the song, but 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 the mix like really kind of engages me. Um, so I was curious to know like how heavily you use automation in your mixes and you know, is it, it are you using a lot of automation to do that or is it compression? Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, there's, I, so it's both, but what you're talking about is the automation for sure. And I'm, I'm glad you noticed <laughs> cause, uh, cause, cause that's important to me. Anytime something new comes in, I try to bump it up a little bit for just a second. So it catches your ear like volume wise. Um, I'll just turn it up like, like kind of a lot sometimes like two to five DB just for like a quick second and fade it back down or, you know, just whatever I hear the needs to happen to get your attention for, for a certain thing. If I think it's important, if it's something that's not important and it's just like a background layer, I'm not going to do it. But any little thing that was there to like make you feel something or catch your attention, um, I just try to bump the volume a little bit. And then the other thing I do is if there's a kick drum hit, when that thing comes in, I'll turn up that kick drum hit. Cause it's kind of like a, it's like a notification on your phone, you know, <laughs> when you, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, no matter what's happening, if your phone goes, bang, you're going to turn your head. Like we're programmed to do that. So no matter what's happening in the song, I know that if I turn the kick drum up a lot on that point, you're going to turn your head and go, Oh, I'm listening. And, uh, that's kind of like, I learned that from, there's a song I've said this before, but the, I'll always tell people, uh, Nirvana, never mind, and specifically smells like teen spirit has the most insane kick drum automation. And every time something comes in or something's supposed to hit, I swear the kick drum turns up like 10 dB it, it, and it's, it's nuts. Next time you listen to that song, <laughs> if you didn't already know that it'll blow your mind, how intense the kick drum automation. But I remember listening to that in my car in my late teens, early twenties and being like, wait a minute, that's not just like Dave Grohl. That's a mix thing. And he's like, that's Andy Wallace going, let me get your attention. Uh, you know, this is the chorus and it's going to freaking hit. Um, and so that I kind of try to take that inspiration and, and put that into my mixes and, and make sure people notice when things change and things happen by turning up the kick and turning up that little whatever the thing is that's happening. And I do think that sometimes drummers naturally have a tendency to when like a new part comes in or when they're going to a crash, like to go to a chorus or something like that, they do tend to dig in a little bit more, but sometimes just accentuating that even more yeah. really makes it pop. I think some of that comes from being a drummer too, because that you, you do get taught to accent the, the starts of new sections and accent the downbeat. Um, but you know, when you, when you start mixing and you start compressing stuff, you start losing some of that, dynamics and i mean just the fact that microphones don't really convey dynamics um the same way that we perceive them or play them all the time you know what i mean like they exaggerate dynamics in certain ways and then downplay other types of dynamics um so i like to re-exaggerate that stuff and i i like to compress the crap out of stuff too a lot of times not kick drums so much uh, but like vocals, um, you know, I'll compress the life out of vocals and then I'll breathe the life back in with automation. So doing that is kind of like getting it, it's me gaining control over stuff, because if you've ever like I know I'm like just jumping to vocals, but I feel like it plays into drums and everything else. But a vocal is a really easy one to visualize, because if, if you've ever recorded a vocal you and looked at a waveform, if you recorded it without compression, like it's not like the first part of the word is always the loudest thing it's it's all over the place like like vocally dynamics that are picked up through a microphone are so different than how we perceive them with our ears and then you have obviously you have to compress you can't just like record rock vocals and not compress them then you have to compress them then you're just kind of getting random dynamics you know what i mean like the, the, the dynamics are not necessarily the way you want to feel the dynamics so my philosophy is just to compress the life out of them <laughs> compress the snot out of it you know what i mean to the point that i basically have a clean slate and then i'm i play god and i have control over the dynamics and whatever words you hear the most um and that to me is like like that's that's how i want to show you the song and not necessarily whatever random thing is happening in the world with the microphone and the compression you know if that makes sense for sure 
one of one of my early mentors basically when he when he was describing compression especially with vocals he used the word start as a good example and was basically like this that gets lost and it's like always that tart like hard t yep. that, that really jumps out so you know with compression you can even that out make it all nice and even and you hear the whole word and it doesn't sound like really random and like somebody's missing half the half the word you know so it, that makes exactly. sense you need you need to have that compression to to make it audible yep but then you need the control after the compression to make it enjoyable. Yes. It's like I'm making everything audible, but then I don't want everything flatlined. You know what I mean? Because that's kind of boring. So then I go back and make sure certain words are louder, starts of certain words are louder. So you, you had talked about automating certain things like the kick drum and like mainly it sounds like mainly transitions going from like chorus verse to chorus or that kind of thing. What other kind yeah, of automation moves do you down. typically do on drums? Just in general, like what? Do you have like a, when you start automation, is it something where you've got this kind of checklist of like, I want to hit these points pretty much all the time? Yeah. Yeah. My checklist goes, um, the, the, my checklist kind of goes like this. I get a basic drum mix, uh, and then I go through the snare and toms and I'll just like, I kind of eyeball the snare track most of the time and I will turn up ghost notes, uh, anything that feels like it's going to be kind of quiet because I'm not, I don't compress, I compress the snare, but not crazy hard because I, I don't need too much bleed coming up. So my checklist goes snare. Uh, if I have a snare sample blended in, every time there's a fill, I'll basically turn up the real track and turn down the sample um, just real fast, uh, you know, on, on each part. That way you just kind of get a little more life. Uh, but then like really fast snare fills, I'll actually turn them down uh, because you're, you're, you you kind of get it gets a little bit overbearing sometimes. Then I go through the toms, do what I talked about earlier, get the toms leveled out. Uh, and then, um, do you do the same thing with toms where you automate the samples down or do you tend to keep those in there? It kind of depends. Um, you know, if the drummer's hitting the toms really good, I probably don't even have samples in there. Uh, if I do have samples, yes. If it's like a super fast fill or a part that, uh, um, you know, where there's like a groove on the floor tom or the toms and it's a really important groove and not just like straight up hard hits, then I'll either take the sample out or turn it way down and the real tom up. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of like adjusting those mixes from part to part between the sample and the real instrument on the snare and the toms in order to maintain the feel of each part. Uh, and then I go through and I automate the room mics. That's the next thing on my checklist. Um, you know, if there's a part that's super chill with the, and, and a snare roll or something, uh, I'll basically any chill part, I'll turn the room mics way up. Uh, and then for like really rocking stuff, I'll turn it down cause I don't need that much cymbal. Um, and I just like chill parts to sound a little more spacey. Then I go through the hi-hat and ride. I, it's probably sounds crazy, but then I go through the hi-hat and ride. Anytime someone hits a ride bell, I turn it up. Uh, you know, I'll probably turn the ride mic off, um, Anytime they're not playing the ride, hi-hats, turn them up, make sure all the cool little stuff is heard on every little part. Uh, and then I go through the kick drum and I'll do, the first thing I do is the downbeats, like I said, but then I'll go through and if there's any part um, where, especially when a sample's blended heavily, if there's any part where there's like a real like kick and snare groove, I'll make sure um, each downbeat comes up on the kick a little bit so you feel it. Um, or like super fast doubles on the kick, I'll turn the... Um, first one down. So it's like, da -da, da -da, you know, instead of just like two hard ones, if there's a double kick part, I'll, I'll turn up the start of each one and the re and turn the rest of them down a little bit so that you don't get, uh, overwhelmed with all that low end that's coming in. Um, I get pretty, I, I get pretty specific about it. Um, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of automation going that's on. That's sure. a great answer to that question. Like super detailed there. Yeah. And, and then bass and guitars, I, I don't, well, guitars, I, I do a ton of automation, uh, but guitars are almost like mixing a song within themselves, just making sure whatever guitar part is the most important for each section is is most in the forefront. Um, you know, I'll do a lot of automation on solos to make sure the start, the hit of each note is like louder. Uh, so the pick attack is really clear. Um, bass, I don't do a ton of automation unless there's something like really specific. Um, you know, and then vocals, I, I actually go through and automate up the very first, the beginning of each syllable, <laughs> uh, either me or, or whatever intern or assistant is working. That's amazing, man. Well, th thank you for that answer. Cause I, I think that that, I think a lot of people kind of forget about the power of automation and, and 
you know, all the things that you can do with it and, or why you would do it, right? Like, there's the obvious, yeah. like, bring things up when they're quiet, but, you know, to, to really create that energy and excitement in the mix, it does require those, like, micro moves. Exactly, and that's where the excitement comes from. And I always encourage people to try to start there and focus on that kind of stuff and see what results they get as opposed to diving way too deep into um, EQ and compression because a lot of times your tracks sound better than you realize, but if you're having trouble making everything sit together, um, it's probably just because things aren't popping out or like punching through the way they need to. And, and that actually comes from automation and not necessarily um, EQ or compression. I mean, obviously EQ and compression are important, but what's your mindset when you start a mix? Like what's, what are you ultimately aiming to achieve at the end? And you know, what, how do you, how do you typically tackle a mix? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, so the first thing that's important to me with a mix is to know, to have some kind of mental roadmap or at least a goal, um, for where I'm trying to get. Cause you know, obviously if it's a pop band or like, uh, an indie band or, a jet band or a metalcore band, they're all going to need a completely different treatment. Um, and within those genres there's always like different vibes too so i kind of need to know what what vibe i'm going for uh and and where i'm trying to go with it if it's something i produced then i already know that and if it's something i'm getting from someone else i'll just listen to the rough mix like 10 15 times and just kind of like soak it in and get a vibe for the song uh and then um i'll just start really like i said earlier i I'll get the drums going and I'll get a drum sound that I feel fits um, whatever uh, vision I'm going for or the band is going for. Uh, and then once I get that drum sound, I just kind of build around it. Um, I don't really do the automation until I kind of have a, a, a basic like mix for each set of instruments. You know what I mean? Um, and I have a lot of different like, uh, track presets and just different stuff I do with my hardware for different types of music. But, uh, but the most important thing, I guess, as I ramble here is, uh, uh, to, to, to know my end game and where I'm trying to get, and then get that drum and bass mix really solid. Um, and then everything else kind of just works itself out. Usually, um, I, I don't have to think too hard on the rest of rest of the stuff I just kind of like bring up what, what needs to be there. And you had mentioned presets, like how, how important are presets to your workflow? Um, you know, uh, to be honest, it's a, it's a bit of a new thing for me. I was on pro if for people who are, I've been around a while. Uh, I, I was on pro tools 10 until like, I think a year and a half ago, maybe two years now. Um, Same I really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was in the stone age for a long time, so I didn't have track presets and I never got, unless it was something really specific, like, uh, you know, I had this like gate preset that I made in like 2002 and like a couple random, like special effect reverb production things that I saved, you know, along the way. Um, I wasn't way into presets because I don't like, so when I bring up an EQ on a drum, I feel like the worst thing I can do for myself is, um, and I'm going to contradict myself here in a minute, but, but I, for a long time, I felt like the worst thing I could do is hear that drum and then flip on a preset and have this drastic change happen instead of knowing in my mind what I wanted to do, like I the presets in my mind, but turning those knobs and going towards my goal and being like, oh, I need to stop here or I'm cutting too much 1K in the snare. It's harder for me to, to see or, well, not see. It's harder for me to hear that if I just turn a preset on, cause I'm like, Oh, okay. Scooped. It's snappy. That's cool. But if I'm doing it, I'm consciously like, okay, 7.5 dB of 10 K is awesome. But my preset had 10 dB of 10 K and that's just a little too much. And I can hear it cause I'm turning it, but I'm not going to hear it if I turn it on and then start turning stuff down. If that makes sense. Like the sudden shock of the preset kind of messes with me. Changes your calibration yeah. of what you're hearing, right? Exactly. That that's it. It, it like I yeah, it, it definitely messes with my calibration and that's something for me that I've struggled with in the past and feel like 
I have certain ways to not lose uh, lose my path because if anyone who's ever mixed, like it's really easy to get lost. It's really easy to go overboard. It's really easy. Um, and, and sometimes that's why presets help people. But for me, when I use presets in that fashion, um, I, I get lost really fast because I'm like going too many different places. Um, but that being said, I do really enjoy track presets because I have a bunch of signal chains that I've set up um, that have not super drastic or specific settings, but plugins that work really well together that are all just there so I can hit a track preset and then, okay, I've got, uh, you know, BX SSLE going into um, the UAD 1176, going into the UAD distressor, you know, going into... Uh, Fab filter C2 for doing some side chaining stuff and then into a DS or, you know, just all kinds of stuff. And it's just there and I don't have to like search for it or think at all. And then I can just bring it up and be like, okay, like this, you know, I know this was the ratio I was going to use and whatnot, but I don't have the actual like threshold down and I don't really have the EQ going necessarily uh, other than like, you know, if it's a vocal, I'll have the EQ points set, but I don't have them like cut or boosted. So I love the track presets because it gives me a starting point that's really fast, but it doesn't like have to mess with my head um, in that regard. And then the other great thing is like, especially for vocals, uh, I work on a lot of stuff uh, that has like, but anywhere from 10 to like 50 vocal tracks. So, and a lot of them get treated the same way. A lot of them are just like harmony stacks or like backup vocals that all need the same treatment. So once I get one dialed in, I just save the track preset for that album for like, you know, that's called like backup vocal two or whatever. And, uh, then I can just, you know, hold whatever shift command or shift option command. Um, and then just apply that track preset to like 50 tracks. And that's super cool. Uh, that, that's a huge thing for, for track presets. Same with guitars. I work on a lot of projects that have like literally like 80 freaking guitar tracks. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really smart way to, to do it. Cause, cause you're right. I think that a lot of people, when you have those like extreme moves in your preset, it, it is hard to calibrate your ears to it. And there are a lot of people that just think that the idea of a template is, you know, drag your tracks in and you don't even listen to it without the t the presets or the plugins. And, you know, it's just done. Right. And it's like it's so yeah. hard to go backwards that way, as opposed to just like, you know, if you're going to keep those presets, I think having like small changes, if anything, like maybe a couple dB here and there then it's like not as drastic of a of a deal to to calibrate to but i think you hit hit the nail on the head for sure i think the concept of just bringing up a template and things working is is a dangerous for me at least personally is a dangerous way to work one because i'm going to instantly obviously lose the unique vibe of the record because i'm just trying to slap some other record's treatment over it um, and then on top of that, I'm, I'm going to lose perspective really fast because, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not listening to the record. I'm listening to a template. And you have to think too, if, if you're not the person that's, I guess it's a little different if you're the one that's producing it and you have your way of recording the bands all the time, setting the levels a certain way, then, then at least like your templates are kind of catered to your workflow. But if you're working off someone else's stuff, they've probably already got a little bit of a vision going on for what the band should sound like. So they're probably tracking it that way too. And you know, when you add all your layers to it and your presets, then it, then it's out to lunch. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's super weird. And, and even when you're working on your own stuff, I mean, if you're working on your own stuff, you should be kind of mixing to some degree as you go. You know what I mean? Like you don't, you're not just like blindly tracking stuff with no EQ or compression and then going, okay, I'm going to mix it later. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, you can, I, and I definitely did that when I was younger, but that's a, that'll dig yourself a hole super fast as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, th there's nothing wrong with presets. I mean, I think it's, a you know, I've been, I have been, this has been my only job for 18 years and I've been using pro tools for longer than that. And if I didn't have certain presets saved from like, you know, 15 years ago, when I go or, or even just having the session around is really important because if you didn't have that at all and I'm like, oh man, the friggin' guitars on this record were super cool. What did I do 15 years? Like, I don't remember what I did in the, like, I might remember what amp or cab we used, but I don't remember like what EQ or weird friggin' plugin I was using 15 years ago. But if I have that preset or I 
have that session still, being able to bring that up is incredible. I'm not saying presets are bad by any means. Um, I think just you have to be careful with how specific you go uh, with preset settings or preset signal change. Absolutely. And there, there, there's a time and place for everything, right? Like, yep. you know, yeah, exactly. even with like uh, amp sims and all that kind of stuff too, like having the tones that you know you could trust and all that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, makes makes total sense. Speaking of amp sims, you recently put out a plugin with STL tones for uh, their tone hub. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Tone hub is awesome. Um, STL came up with the tone hub concept. I mean, it's been a while now, it's been in the making, but uh, it, it just came out. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's a, so it's basically a profiler and they call it tracing. Um, and it's a lot like a Kemper, but actually quite a bit more advanced. And, um, I have multiple tone packs, which are amps that I've profiled for tone hub specifically. Um, well, some, some of the first ones were done for a Kemper before tone, uh, hub was out, but basically tone hub kind of takes the place of your Kemper from the playing side. Um, and it runs our profiles and it sounds incredible and the cool thing about tone up that really sets it apart from the kemper is that on the kemper the back end is uh and and maybe i'm getting ahead of myself people know what the kemper profiler is it's basically like uh an amp sim hardware that analyzes how your amp works and how um the amp is gain staged and then it does its best to recreate that um, and so you play through it like you would a guitar amp, um, but it's basically a digital guitar amp. And Tone Hub, our, our software, STL software, uh, does a similar thing, but um, the for one, the, the profiling side of it is way more advanced. Um, and the the back end that plays the, the profiles or the traces is significantly more advanced. So the Kemper, all everything you're doing is based on everything you're playing is just based on one guitar amp and one tone stack. So like every guitar amp has its own unique EQ on it. And, the, and and obviously that can't be profiled. It's just like the actual tone that you're playing at the time. So the Kemper has one amp, one amp that it simulates and it has one EQ set that it simulates and every single amp you profile it basically just figures out how to harmonically an EQ like like the overall tone EQ match your amp, but it doesn't do anything to actually match the feel of the amp and the difference or, or the EQ. Like if you profile a JCM 800 on a Kemper, you don't get the JCM 800 EQ to, to tweak it. You know what I mean? You just get um, whatever the Kemper's EQ is. So with tone hub, it does all that, but there's like 20 different amps on the back end that have been very carefully simulated as to where the Kemper just has one amp that's being simulated. Uh, Tone Hub actually has like uh, all a bunch of different amps like because ah, man, th this is hard to talk about without just rambling. But <laughs> that was uh, super so fascinating. Like, yeah. So the cool thing is like there's a 5150 back end, uh, you know, there's a JCM 800 back end. Uh, so when you when you use a JCM 800 profile in Tone Hub, um, it knows that it's a JCM 800 and the EQ works exactly like a JCM 800. The SAG is exactly like a JCM 800. Uh, the feel is exactly like a JCM 800 because the, the thing that it's uh, molding the harmonic profile and the EQ profile around is actually a JCM 800 on the back end. Same with the 5150, same with a bunch of different stuff, Fender Bassman. And the genius thing about that is that a lot of amps themselves are just based on other amps. You know what I mean? Like the Marshall Super Lead is just based on a 59 Baseman um, and the 800 derives from that. And so uh, a lot of, even though they don't have every single amp on the back end, they have every like thing that anything's ever derived from <laughs> on the back end. So like, so just for clarity, uh, when you say back end, are you talking about from from your perspective as the person creating these profiles, or can the user access these controls as well? No, this is just so by back end, I just mean so like I'm just talking about the coding. Gotcha. Okay. By back end, I mean. Like the way, obviously all of this stuff is fake, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all, it's all just simulated. Uh, so, um, you know, the Kemper's 
what, what I mean by back end is just the coding of what they have programmed. Basically, they've programmed one fake amp and then everything works around this one fake amp. Uh, on the Kemper. Tone Hub, yeah, on the Kemper. And then on Tone Hub, they've programmed like 20 plus fake amps. And so everything that gets profiled, everything you're trying to match, instead of just going and and you're like playing through one fake amp that's that's trying to match a different type of amp, it immediate the tone hub immediately goes and it selects uh, whatever amp is closest to what's been profiled that you're playing through. So you're playing through a programmed version of that amp instead of a programmed version of a different amp that's pretending to be another amp, that an even sense. different amp. Yeah, it's kind of it's like a it's really it's kind of wild. And the longer you think about it, the crazier it gets. But <laughs> um, but but it's but Tone Hub's a lot more advanced in in the short of things, and uh, it's and it's great sounding, and it's way more flexible because of that. Yeah, I definitely have to check it out. I, I've been eyeing it down for a little while, and and uh, it seems like it's super powerful. And everyone I know that's tried it has said amazing things. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really cool. I'm excited. And I have another pack. I have two packs. I have a, two guitar packs and a bass pack out for it right now. Uh, so when you download the plugin, when you buy the plugin, they're available uh, to purchase within the plugin itself. And then I have another set of packs coming out um, pretty soon here that I'm really excited about. Now that you you have this tone up pack and, and sounds like you've been working with Kempers for a while as well. Do you are you the kind of person that uses all amp sims at this point or do you still use a combination nah. of real amps and all that? I don't use any amp sims when I record. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge hypocrite. Um I, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to call you out there. <laughs> Just, no, 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 no. It's. Uh, I like to talk about it because I think it. Uh, I think people get lost, um, and I understand why. Like you only see so much on the internet, and you see what I promote, um, and I think the thing that gets lost in translation a little bit. Um, and, and things that people like try to call me out on uh, uh, is just that I have a studio where I can be super loud. I own lots of guitar amps that I love. Um, I have my cabs set up all the time. I have multiple cabs that I love. The mics are always on them. Uh, it's really easy for me. It's easier for me to use a real amp um, and and get that tone and and know exactly what I want to do because of the way that I work um, with my real amps and real cabs. And I still firmly believe that 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 will always sound better. Um, but not everybody's in that situation. Like most people are not in that situation. Most people are not in a situation where they can own 20, uh, you know, high quality, amazing sounding guitar amps. Uh, you know, most people aren't in situations where they can be super loud. You know, I'm, I can turn a hundred watt amp up as loud as I freaking want because my control room or my live room is really soundproof. Um, and, and that's something I have the luxury of doing, but most people don't have that. Um, and the fact that we live in a world where a fake amp is like 80 to 90 percent there um, is plenty for most people. And that's that's great. And that's what I'm like, what I'm selling, I guess. And what what I'm promoting is that other people can have something really close to what I have for like 200, 300 bucks. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and they can do it in their bedroom and they can do it. They can use it on a freaking airplane. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm not out here saying I'm using digital amps myself. Like that's not why I promote this stuff. It's not why I make profiles, uh, at all. It's, it's not for me. It's so I can take the real stuff I'm using and give someone the closest possible version that, yeah, that they can. You're use just anyway. creating tools and, and for other people to use. Exactly. Exactly. It's just like the CLA plugins, like CLA is not actually using waves plugins. Like, come on. <laughs> uh, like I, I'm sure, he, I mean, he is, I'm sure he, he is, is he but is. I, I know he is, but like, he's still using all that stuff in the back. He's still mixing on his SSL. Like, you know, they didn't make the, the wave CLA suite. And he's like, rad. Now I can just sit in my, on my freaking toilet and mix records on my laptop <laughs> like that's not what happened uh it's tools for other people and i'm definitely not trying to compare myself to cla here either but like i think that's something that that just i, I love to talk about and i'm happy to talk about because it, it is it's tools for other people and and i'm stoked to be able to provide that but it's exactly that you're just you're just creating tools for people to use and and why not right like sometimes that amp sim is going to be the thing you need versus the real amp like oh, yeah. you know you might not have access to it so why wouldn't you use it right and and it's like it's not like anybody's making worse off mixes right now because they use the SSL plugin versus an actual board like 
we're all just using what we have access to and why wouldn't we just make the best we can with the tools we have? Exactly, exactly. And people are making incredible records that are all in the box and all digital. Um, you know, it's more about how your brain works and perceives things and and the result you get based on your experiences and 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 how you hone those experiences into a mix. Um, it's a def, we, we, we now live, it wasn't always this way, but we now, de like you said, we now live in a world where, um, it's really just the tools we use and how we use them. Um, and, and it's, and, and that's why there's different sounding records and, and different things that are inspiring in different ways. Cause we're, we're using different tools and we all have different brains and we're using them the, the best to our ability. Um, there's definitely no, in a lot of ways, there's really no hard, like this is better than that. You're not going to like not make the best mix ever because you don't have analog gear. That's what I'm, I guess all I'm trying to say, you know what I mean? Like the best mix ever is going to come from your brain and your experience. It's not going to come from anything you're using, you know, specifically. I think that that's just what it is. Like, you know, just, you use what you have and you make the best of it and, and, you know, you can still, you can still get there. And, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the listener doesn't give a shit if you used a real amp or like fake amp, as long as the song's there and they've got the, the, so, the tone that they like and, you know, they can make it out, then they're happy with it. Yep, exactly. I want to shift over to mastering a little bit because I know that you do quite a bit of that as well. And it seems like these days it, that seems to be a pretty uh, busy part of your schedule for, just from the releases. It you is, put out. yeah. So I'm curious to get your, your opinion on this. Like, I know that there's a lot of people who maybe misguidedly feel like if they have EQ compressors, limiters, and and they know that they can create great mixes with that stuff, they understand those tools. There's some people that feel like, well, I have the same tools as a mastering engineer, so what's the argument for, for getting it mastered by a professional? And I'm just curious to get your take on that. For one, from my perspective, my mastering process is all analog. <laughs> and uh, that can make a difference for people who are mixing all digital. I know I just like, kind of contradicted this, but, um, it can make a big difference. And, and the number one thing is experience. Um, just having, you know, 18 years myself of mastering stuff, uh, and, and knowing all the little moves to get that last little 10% out of your mix and, um, and getting a fresh set of ears is, can be important. Although I, again, I master all my own stuff. Cause a lot of times when other people try to master my stuff, it's been unsuccessful. Um, but, uh, but that's what I say to people is like, sure. You can have ozone, you can have, uh, a waves L2 or fab filter pro L2, and you can limit the crap out of your mix and, uh, it'll be loud. Um, and that's fine, but you know, at least experiment with with having other people master your stuff um you know if you're if your mastering budget is like 20 bucks don't, don't bother <laughs> you know you you can probably come up with something fine yourself but um you know hopefully you can you can save up some money and get a good master if if you're if you're the one mixing your own stuff or uh you know you can you can try to build that into your rate if uh you're having a band do stuff because it really can make a big difference um i i I really enjoy mastering and I, I get a lot of joy out of helping other people's mixes, uh, get somewhere where they couldn't quite get them. Um, and that's something a lot of people that are hesitant and like, what possibly more could there be, uh, find that there actually is more, there, there's more to be squeezed out of that orange. So, um, it's, uh, it's a good thing to do. I think, uh, you know, if there's certain people out there, people like me, I tried a lot of times to have other people master stuff. And even though it didn't always work the way I wanted, it did teach me a lot about what I needed to do and what I needed to learn. So no, I don't think there's a problem with mastering your own stuff, but yes, I think you should have other people master your stuff until you learn and gain the confidence. Uh, if you feel the need to learn and gain the confidence, um, to, uh, do stuff yourself. But it's not just like slapping a limiter on. It's not just uh, making sure things are loud. There's there's a lot to mastering that uh, to to actually make yourself sound professional and stand up against other professional mixes on Spotify or iTunes or or YouTube or whatever. For sure. And I think a large part of mastering is is kind of just like the the gut check of of like making sure that you've got the feel of the song proper and all that kind of stuff. And for somebody who's been so 
who's been mixing it and gets like really into the nitty gritty of everything. And they're like super fixated on small details. Sometimes it's hard to, to like recalibrate and, and have that gut check of like, okay, well, like how does this, this mix overall sound now? Like what, what, what broad changes do I have to make to, to enhance this or get fine tuned with it? Exactly. Having that, that second perspective, um, can be really important. And, um, and, and you're right. Like, yeah, it's a gut check. And when you, um, are super fixated on all that other stuff. Um, you might, you might get too fixated on the master. I, I, that's something I find that happens a lot too, is, is people get overly fixated and they send me what they've been sending the band. And then they send me, cause you know, a lot of, it's okay to mix with a limiter on or, or check. I mean, I don't really, I don't think you should mix with a limiter on, but, uh, personally, but you should definitely have it there and turn it on when you're mixing, you know what I mean? To see how your mix reacts to limiting. Uh, and you know, people go crazy, have like some fake tape machine and all, you know, 10, all 10 plugins on their mastering chain. And then they'll send me the version with and the version without. So I can hear what they've been sending the band. And a lot of times the version without sounds better. It's just quiet (laughs) and they've done a really good job and they've mixed a really good sounding record. And then what I can do is achieve the like volume and the things they were trying to do by overly fixating on the master, but doing it in a more tame way that brings out what, what they did really well in the mix. Um, and, and not get kind of stomped on by the over fixation of the master, their over fixation of the master. Um, I find a lot of my best masters happen really fast. It's just kind of a reaction and, and, uh, action. Yeah, and, and that goes back to what I said earlier about the gut check thing. It's like I, I think a mastering engineer can work fast because they work that way based on their their gut reaction. Whereas like the person who spent four or five, six hours or more mixing something, they they have no concept of how to how to get that gut feeling back because they've they've analyzed it way too much. Yep, it's like uh, I mean, it's kind of like working on a car yourself or going to a mechanic. Like, and I'm not talking classic cars. I mean like. If you're working on a brand new car and maybe you know how the car's computer works and you can figure that all out, but it's going to, if you're trying to fix a major problem in your car or, or, or an upgrade or something, it's going to take you alone, like a day, a couple days, a lot of time, but you take it to a mechanic and your car is going to be perfect and it's going to be perfect really fast because he knows what he's doing and he does it all day and he has a whole freaking slew of tools. He's not making trips to the to auto zone or whatever to like pick up something new like he knows what to do and he's going to do it super fast and i'm the weirdo that chooses to work on my own master <laughs> you know my own car uh because i'll spend that time in the garage but i think a lot of times uh you should just take it to the mechanic and get it done right that's a great analogy for it though because you're right like the fact that you master your own records it actually does make sense because in in that metaphor you are the mechanic so you already have that experience and that's why you can make those decisions because you know what you're doing but the person who doesn't have that experience why bother like you could you could you will take a lot longer take a lot longer and you can do some major damage to your mix and you might roll the mix out with damage (laughs) you know what i mean like 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 i was uh, you know the mechanic analogy is is what it is but uh I think the most important thing is just the the over fixating on the master really like kind of degrades people's really good mixes a lot of times. Um, and, and I pride myself in being able to have a threshold and know what how much really needs to be done to make sure that mix is awesome. Um, and I have a signal chain that is very flattering uh, to making things louder and and maintaining the stability and the um, the authenticity of the original mix. And to the, to your point too, of people putting a lot of weight on mastering, like I I think at the end of the day, just make a mix that still sounds as great as it does, like as, as, as great as it can, because you don't want your mastering engineer to have to go and totally change it into something completely new. If you know, no. if you, if you know how to do it and get the results, but I can. And like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can, and I will, if I have to, but, uh, but, but no, yeah, that's not, that's not what, uh, that's not the end goal for sure. Yeah. The mastering engineer isn't supposed to be the magician. It's just, you know, the fixer, I guess, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. On the note of like, 
mastering, I, I feel like there's two schools of thoughts when it comes to mastering engineers. There's the people who feel that mastering is all about making broad EQ moves, boosts and cuts and that kind of stuff. And then there's the people who are very surgical and that's what they do. Like they just focus on the very narrow frequency ranges and mastering that way. What's your approach? Do you favor one more than the other? Um, I mean, I, I find myself doing both, um, depending on what it needs. I think the most important thing is to not, is to, uh, get over yourself and your process and, uh, listen to the music and, and, and listen to what the music and the mix needs. Um, if it's a killer mix, and the energy's there and, you know, it might just need a little bit of uh, high and low or there's a little too much high and low. I mean, I do masters sometimes where there's just like, uh, you know, a little bit of shelf uh, in the high end and the low end and uh, no compression and just like a little bit of smart limiting. And, um, and that's the master. And then sometimes, you know, I'm literally doing like crazy notches and then i'm mixing it in parallel and i have a second one mixed in parallel with crazy boosts uh and then you know one of them super comp you know sometimes I'm, I'm doing a lot but it's really just about whatever i think is going to elevate the mix the most and sometimes when i'm doing a lot i've done masters where i'm doing a ton and have all kinds of parallel stuff going on and it's really just to achieve a pretty minor effect it's not like i'm doing all this crazy stuff and your mix is gonna be drastically different which sometimes it is but sometimes i'm doing a lot of crazy stuff just to like be able to get a certain vibe that someone's created like cer certain types of mixes just can't be loud that, that that's one of the things there's just like certain types of mixes uh and it's nothing specific but just sometimes a mix doesn't want to be loud but it is really cool. And a lot of that has to do with low end energy, uh, other stuff. But if a mix is really cool and doesn't like to be loud, doesn't really react to the limiter well, sometimes I have to do a ton of background stuff and, and, and tricky stuff just to make the mix appear slightly different, but also so I can get it loud. So I, I come from both sides. Sometimes I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff so you can hear crazy stuff. Sometimes I'm doing crazy stuff just so that something can sound pretty much the same, but be loud. Uh, and then sometimes I'm doing very little because the mix just ends up being loud naturally and doesn't need a ton, but just needs that extra little finish. So on that note of kind of creativity and like, you know, exp adding lots of layers and trying crazy things, you know, how do Aside from the normal cleanup of making tracks sound nice and clear, how do you go about making more of those creative moves in mastering? Is it something that, you know, you just feel like the band's hired you to do it and to get the results however you get there? Or is it something that you, you sometimes have to talk to the band about? And Most of the time, I don't talk to the band about it before the first version. Um, a lot of times, I will just listen and um go with my gut and my inspiration and do what I think, like, I guess a sort of taking an art artistic stance of just like, this is what I want to hear. And this is what I would do to make this cool. And 90% 90, 90 of the time people are stoked and that's what they wanted. And, and I'll make that decision, you know, whether I do a lot or a little, um, or whether you hear a lot or a little, uh, and then, you know, sometimes bands are like, no, nah, that's not what we wanted at all. Uh, we want it more like this and then I'll go back and, um, do my best to, to achieve their vision. And it always ends up working out. Uh, but a lot of times I find that if I, I try to talk to the band, unless they have something specific, they need to tell me obviously like track changes, transitions, all that stuff. I'm, there's no way in hell I would ever be able to guess that kind of stuff. Yeah, of course. But, uh, but tonally, if the band doesn't come to me with something that they've been specific about, I'll just go with my gut. Cause if I start asking questions, I feel like it always like, because people don't really fully understand mastering or they have this, like they think it's this magical thing that they need to understand when they don't really like, sometimes it's pretty friggin' simple. Uh, and, but people get this, like, it's like if you ask someone like what kind of magic tricks they like and how to do them, like you just end up going down this weird like path that is super unnecessary when instead of like getting a bunch of misinformation and skewing my vision of something, uh, 
I can just listen and react. And, th and that's where the best stuff comes out for me usually as a mastering engineer. Um, it, it's too easy for me. You know, if people are like, oh, we're like an indie band, but we want to sound like under oath to find the great line. I'm like, what the? Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. that's not going to happen. Uh, and then I start making it loud and crushed and weird. And they're like, no, that's not what we wanted. We also like, okay, computer. And I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. That's probably what I would have done in the first place. But you said you liked this nasty sounding metalcore record. So, you know. A lot of times, uh, I, I just try to go with my gut on on mastering stuff. Yeah, I think that that sounds uh, like the right approach there. <laughs> it happens though, man. People bring up like really strange stuff, and that's why I try to like avoid that if I can. People just bring up stuff, and it messes with my head, and it, it's funny. I wish I had a list of like the absolutely comical stuff that people have, <laughs> you start one. have brought up. I, I probably should. I will now. <laughs> It'll go on the coffee table book. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that it's funny too because you're right. There are some people that have this vision of mastering as this like elusive art. And then there are some people that do understand it a little better. So I feel like when, when you ask people for a reference, that, that spectrum of what they understand of, of mastering could, could, yeah, they, they might be saying under oath when they are that indie band, but maybe it's because they do understand, like they like the frequency balance or they like the, the levels and all that kind of stuff. But then there is a band that's like, well, no, we wanted it distorted. So it, you have to really get clear on what that vision is. Exactly what it is that they like about a specific record. And a lot of times when it gets to the mastering point, a lot of that stuff isn't necessarily obtainable. But you're right. Obviously, if it's especially if it's coming from the mix engineer, um, I'll take it much more seriously. <laughs> and uh, or, or if the band knows what they're talking about. Um, but usually you can tell. Usually the email or the phone conversation is, is, is pretty clear as far as like, like if basically, I guess what I'm saying is if no one's mentioned anything, I'm not going to ask because anyone that wants something specific is going to mention it. So I, I don't feel the need to go out and ask like, what kind of record do you want this to sound like? Cause I feel like if they're coming to me, there, there's already kind of something specific that's been, uh, you, you know, I guess if they're coming to me, they want me to do my thing. And so I'm going to do my thing, which is not necessarily a thing, but is just listening and then deciding which one of my million things. Yeah. I they've heard your previous work. They know that they could trust that you're going to get good results. And that's why they're yeah, hiring it's you. It's kind of a trust thing. Yeah. And then if we need to go back and I did the wrong one of my million things and it was supposed to be something else, that's fine. We can do, do some revisions and, and do it that way. But, and I think it's also safe to, to assume that, you know, if if it is the mixing engineer that is reaching out to you, they they are the one that understands the the final product that's going to yes. come out of you. Yep. Whereas if you yep. get a band reaching out to you, there's there's a greater chance that they don't get it. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. One of the most important parts of mastering is mix translation and getting things to to sound great outside of your studio and and into people's cars and st their own home stereos and all that, all that kind of stuff. How do you ensure that your masters will translate accurately across other sets of speakers? Um, my monitors, my monitors are the, are the most important thing for sure. Um, I'm using Dutch and Dutch eight C's. They translate incredibly well. Um, so, you know, I, that's kind of a, outside of just saying my monitors, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not totally sure how to answer that question because some of it I think is just comes from experience of knowing what can and can't work, uh, on a general array of different speakers you know um there's just certain things that i probably that i couldn't kind of untangible things you know that i just know that if i hear it i'm like oh that's not gonna work in a car or that's not gonna sound good on the phone so uh, i'll adjust it but i don't know that i could rattle off like specific things it's more just you know the an abundance of things in certain frequencies that react in a way you know it's not like every phone you have to like roll roll off uh you know at 18k so you don't get sizzly stuff or like i never have anything under 40 because a car subwoofer is going to it's just like how things react and i know what, how things are going to react in different places from experience from years and years of going different places um you know but i don't even know if they do this anymore but i used to go to fred meyer which is which i realize is a northwest thing but it's like a superstore it's like a a walmart but things are too expensive um <laughs> <laughs> but uh i would go to the electronics section and like back then i would burn a cd and then i would literally play i was so i'm sure i was so 
freaking annoying. And I would just like play it in every boom box and every like home theater thing they had. And then I'd be like, oh yeah, these ones like, this isn't going to work. I can't do this because these kind of, you know what I mean? And everyone has that experience of like going to a bunch of different places, but I would just go to the store and <laughs> do that and then go to my car. But doing that a lot, I did that a lot for years. Uh, now I have a pretty good understanding of, of what will and won't work. And I have monitors that I can trust that are telling me the things uh, that I would normally have had to go different places to hear. Um, so the answer is trustworthy monitors. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it's not even so much your monitors as much as it's just your experience on those monitors. Yeah. Because, because you know, like I might try out those speakers and not know what they sound like at all. Right. But if I spend as much time as you did on them, I could probably learn them. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think there is a point of quality with speakers. Um, like if you had me master, like I could listen to a set of focal twins for 10 years and I would not be able to hear the things I can hear on the Dutch and Dutches when I master on them. I think there's definitely, and it's different with mixing for sure, but with mastering, I think there's a level of speaker that you have to have to be able to hear all the little nuances in 40 Hertz and all the little nuances, you know, at, at 18, uh, and how wide your mid range is. There's a lot of things that I think it is important from a mastering perspective. Again, mixing, dude, I could totally mix a cool sounding record, um, you know, on, on headphones or like, you know, a pair of, uh, whatever the super cheap Yamaha speakers are like, it would be hard, but I could do it, but I probably couldn't master a record that way. Um, I, I could try and it might work, but I, I don't think I could and definitely not in an efficient way and not in an, in an optimal way, just because mastering is so important to be able to hear the way very, very minute things are reacting as opposed to mix, which is a lot more like broad strokes and, and, and heavy handed stuff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, I totally understand that. And that's again, that's where expertise comes in. And that's why you hire a professional, right? <laughs> they, they, they have those, yeah, they yeah. have that equipment. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mo monitors are definitely the most important thing for mastering. Um, but I encourage, I mean, on that note, I would encourage anybody to invest in monitors, especially if you're the type of person who wants to invest in higher quality microphones or, you know, higher quality, anything just get, you don't have to get the monitors I have. They're expensive, but getting high quality monitors is, is your first thing for sure. Cause nothing mean nothing. Not, yeah. Nothing means anything if you can't hear it. And even if you think you can hear it on your cheap monitors, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but you can mix on them. You can mix on them. You just, you know, it's just, uh, I, I think better monitors. It's boring. It's a boring purchase, but it's a, it's an important one. And I wish someone had told me that like 10 years before I finally bought monitors that weren't my Mackie HR 824s or whatever they were. <laughs> No, I think that makes a lot of sense cuz yeah, you you're you're right. Like why bother buying all of the best mics and preamps and this and that if if you can't even hear properly what's coming out of your speakers and what exactly. di what difference does that mic make? You, you might feel like a little more confident that yeah, that mic should sound good, but does it really or or are you just making that up yeah, exactly. to justify your purchase? Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of expensive stuff that doesn't even sound good. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't you can't just look at something and go, "Oh, that's expensive it's going to make everything sound better because it's not and it's really like you said it's how you use it you can't buy something expensive and then just be guessing about you know how how to make it sound good so um monitors are important and then everything else comes after for sure for sure yeah you gotta trust your ears and 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 have have the tools to trust your ears Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, man, I, I think that that's uh, maybe a good spot to end. I don't, I don't want to keep you too long today, but uh, man, I really appreciate all the advice that you gave here. I think you you dropped so much amazing information and and very very helpful. Um, before we go, I, I would love to ask, like, do you have any cool projects that you're working on right now that you you're excited to talk about other than the tone tone up thing? Yeah, man, I have a lot of really neat records in the works. Um, I think something that will be out by the time this podcast comes out. Uh, is the new Dance Gavin Dance record. Um, it's called Afterburner. It's freaking awesome. We spent a ton of time on it. It's one of the fav my favorite things I've worked on. Um, it's really, really, really good record. Worth checking out. Um, I have a band called Nova Charisma that's got some stuff coming out really soon. Not my band, just a band I worked with. Um, and then uh, I'm literally like tonight, hopefully, 
finishing up a, a record for a band called Hail the Sun that's going to come out uh, that I'm super proud of. It's it's one of my favorite things I've worked on um, and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, just keep an eye on my socials. I try to promote everything I work on as much as possible. That's amazing. And speaking of socials, how can people follow you online if they want to learn more about you and your services? I'm most active on Instagram. It's at K-C-R-U-M-M-E-T-T. Um, and then, you know, I'm on Facebook as well. You can look up Chris Crummett. It's Chris with a K and Crummett with a C. Um, but, uh, Instagram is where I'm most active. Um, it's an easy way to contact me. Um, or you can contact me by email at Chris at gmail.com. Well, th- thank you so much for being on this and taking the time out of your day. And I, re- I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, man. It's been a blast. So there you have it, folks. Hope you really enjoyed that. I thought that was a really fun episode, and I feel like I learned a lot from Chris there. It was really cool hearing about his automation and cool hearing about the Tone Hub plugin and just all of the little details that he pays attention to while mixing and while mastering records. And I think that it's a great lesson in paying attention to those details because they really do make a big difference, right? And Chris definitely achieves it. And if you listen to any of his mixes, they sound incredible and they do have so much energy and stuff in there. So Chris, thank you so much for being on here and sharing all that information. I'm really excited to try out some of those automation moves that he was mentioning because they do make a huge difference. And I know that if you listen to his work, you will hear it as well. I also want to thank you, the listener, for sticking around to the end here. And if you're a regular listener, thank you so much for listening to every episode. I really do appreciate it and hope that you're continuing to enjoy these episodes. And if any of you ever have suggestions for a guest that you would love to hear on here, don't hesitate to email me info at masteryourmix.com. I always appreciate hearing who's inspiring people out there. And, you know, if there's a guest that I can bring on here that can help share some information with you and give you some of the insight that you want, then that is my goal here with this podcast. So again, don't hesitate to reach out to me info at masteryourmix.com. If you have any questions or any suggestions, And if this is your first time listening to the podcast, as always, make sure to check out MasterYourMix.com. And I just recently updated the website, so there's a lot of great stuff on there. So make sure to check that out. And I also have a free download for anyone who is stuck with using EQ and compression. If you don't know what to do, you don't know what frequencies to boost or cut, make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com and check out the Ultimate Mixing Blueprint because that walks you through all of that stuff and shows you how to use EQ and compression in your mix and how to dial in settings really quickly. So that's a free download. Just visit masteryourmix.com and sign up for the mailing list and you will get your copy there. So that's it for today's episode. Hope you really enjoyed that and can't wait to talk to you in the next one. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.